The following program is part of Cable in the Classroom, a free service of the cable telecommunications industry and your local cable company. For over 10 years, ESPN has been proud to present the award-winning sports figures, and we want to thank all the athletes who have donated their time to help put your brain in the game. Next up, Olympic gold medalist Darrell Williamson talks time with our Greg Abbey. Runners, take your marks. Set. Oh. 11.67. 11.67, that's a new state record. Well, well, wait a second. I got 11.65 on number 12, and he came in second. Well, well wait a second, because number 5 got a better time than that. 11.60. He, he came in fourth. Well, you guys must have clocked it wrong. I think you clocked it wrong. Yeah, yeah. I, I say that Ray has the new state record. He came in fourth. So? So? He's your kid. Of course you want him to have the record. Well, Carlos is your kid, so you want him to have the new state record. Yeah, well, says you. Yeah, says you. Yeah. Sports figures, put your brain in the game. If you want to call yourself the fastest human on Earth, you have to hold the world record for the 100 meters. Tim Montgomery's 2004 world record of 9.78 was beaten by Asafa Powell's 9.77 in 2005. That's a difference of just one one hundredth of a second. Ah, uh, 11.36, what'd you get? 11.39. Hmm. Timing races to the hundredths of a second isn't so easy. So, is a world record really a world record? What does a hundredth of a second look like? Well, a second looks like this. Well, actually, it looks like this. Uh, right now, you're watching me on video, which records at 30 frames per second. That means each frame is a little more than three one hundredths of a second. One one hundredth of a second is so short, we can't even show it to you because video is too slow. Could they really time a race that accurately? To help us take a look at it, we've got this guy here. Darrell Williamson is one of the most decorated athletes in the history of Baylor track and field. He holds four NCAA titles, 13 All-American honors, in addition to anchoring the gold medal winning 4x400 relay team at the Athens Olympics in 2004. He lives his life by hundreds of a second. So, Daryl, it must be pretty brutal to lose out on a record or, or a race by a hundredth of a second. In 2004, right. I missed out on the Olympic 400 by one, uh, one hundredth of a second. The, the runner ahead of me ran 44.69 and I ran 44.70, so it's not pleasant when it happens to you. So, when you have a moment like that where it's so close a hundredth of a second, does it make you question ever the accuracy of the guy's time in the race? You wonder a little bit, but I mean, technology's coming along, so you just kind of hope that things went the right way or the way they're supposed to. Right. So, I mean, it's probably different. Like, w when you were in high school, you know, what what were some of the things they used then? I mean, it had to be different than at the Yeah, well, the in high Olympics. school, they might have had a fully automatic starter once in Blue Moon uh, right. in, in high school track. But besides that, they used a lot of hand timers, which, you know, of course, isn't, isn't really accurate at sure. all. Okay, guys, so uh, what did we get? 3.1 seconds. 3.3 seconds. 3.0 seconds. Okay, wait a second. We're all over the map. How come? Everybody's reaction time to start the watch is a little different. And different to stop the watch, too. Okay, well, obviously, we can't find the world record like this. And it's not just because of the timer's reaction. Track events have been started with a gun for a long time. On your marks, get set. The problem is the speed of sound. Sound travels slow only around 330 meters per second. Here's the problem. I'm less than one meter from lane one, but I'm eight meters from lane eight. The sound will reach lane one almost instantly, but it'll take a lot longer to reach here. Dividing eight meters by 330 meters per second, we see that it takes the sound of the gun 0 0.0224 seconds. That's over two hundredths of a second later. For the runner in lane eight, two one-hundredths of a second could easily cost them the record. 
Daryl, how did they solve these problems? Well, in 1995, they started something new called the loud gun system. Okay, they use that in Athens, right? Right. And basically with that, there's a flash from the gun that instantly starts to clock to this so that there's no delay. And there's also a speaker at each starting block so the runners hear the gun. Well, actually, no. They hear the commands from the starter and his instructions to start, but they don't hear the gun. But wouldn't that make sense? I mean, for the, if the gun went through the speakers, then the, the runners would, he would hear it all at the same time. Well, almost instantly. Right, because the electricity in the wires is just traveling at almost the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. But the true sound of the gun traveling through the air will get there later, like you just showed. Oh, I see. So there's, there's two guns, the one traveling through the speakers and then the true sound, which is going to get there a couple hundredths of a second later. Which would be too confusing, which is why they go by the true sound of the gun. Yeah, but like we just saw, that gets to each runner differently, too. Yeah, that's the problem. Runners on your marks, get set. The latest technology in starting is called the silent gun system. The gun itself makes no sound. It's really just an electronic switch that triggers a sound to come out of the speakers. It's not as dramatic as the gun, but it's way more accurate. So, Daryl, what are the other aspects to timing the start? Reaction time is also another big part. Reaction time. So, you mean like the runner's reaction to the buzzer? Well, the gun. The gun? I, I thought it was called the buzzer. We still call it a gun. There are rules about reaction times. A runner who jumps the gun leaves the blocks before the gun. Obviously, that's a false start. But if you get off the blocks too fast, even after the gun, that's a false start too. How can a runner get out of the blocks too fast? A starter says, ready, set, and then the gun. They could guess and start just before the gun. If they were lucky, they would get off right after the gun, but faster than if they heard the gun and then reacted. No runner has ever gotten out of the box consistently faster than a tenth of a second, which if you do so will be considered a false start. So wait a second, but how do they figure out if, you, if you've gotten out of the blocks faster than a tenth of a second? Well, the blocks have sensors in them. It lets them know exactly when you leave the blocks. So, Daryl, I guess 0 .101 would be the perfect start? That would be pretty tight. The starter would have to make a judgment call on that. I don't know, man. This is, this is pretty complicated. And that's just the start of the clock. Wait till you see the finish line. I'm frightened. If we didn't care about time, we could just see who crosses the finish line first. Or could we? Sometimes these races are so close, it's pretty hard to tell who won, or who got second, or who got third. Don't they just take a picture now, like a photo finish? Yeah, then you could just look at the picture to figure out who won. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Let's try it. In the late 1800s, Edward Moybridge pioneered stop-motion photography by using a series of still cameras to capture motion. This invention led directly to motion pictures, movies. I'll start the race and you take a picture of the finish. Okay. The picture's late. They've already crossed the line. You can't tell who crossed the line first. It's the same problem we had with a stopwatch. It's the reaction time. Well, couldn't we just use a laser or something to trigger the camera? The rules say the runner whose torso crosses the finish line first is the winner, not a head or a hand or a foot. So uh, where should we put our laser? Um, like chest high? Yeah, but who's chest? I mean, all the runners are different heights. Well, I guess we'd have to do sort of an average. OK, let's try that. It looks like that hand shipped the camera too soon. Huh. Yeah, and they're so close, it's hard to tell who's going to cross first. It seems like trying to take the picture at exactly the right time is not going to work. Well, but what if you took a picture at every time, like a video camera? Well, I think a video camera's too slow. Maybe a faster camera? This is what a photo finish camera actually sees. It only looks at an 8 millimeter slice of the finish line, and it takes a 1,000 pictures a second. We can see exactly what's happening at each 1,000th of a second. The judges can see precisely what is crossing the finish line when. A computer program puts these thin slices together to form an image of each runner crossing the finish line. Ah, 
This is an actual photo finish from a 100 meter dash. Now, what's cool about this picture is that it's not a picture of the finish of the race, it's a picture of the time. See, when they crossed the finish line, it actually looked like this. This line at each runner is the finish line. This is a picture of the finish line at 10.04 seconds. And this is a picture of the finish line 14 one-hundredths of a second later when this runner crossed. Basically, it's a picture of the same place at different points in time. It's pretty cool, right? Ah! They print the wind speed and direction on the photo finish for any outdoor race. Now, a race time with a wind speed of greater than two meters per second that aids the runner is not eligible for record consideration. The camera is recording the finish in thousands of a second, but racers are always rounded up to the nearest hundredth to make up for any inconsistencies between different tracks and equipment. Because no matter how accurate you try to be, there's always room for error. So I guess with today's technology, it's safe to say that a runner is the fastest, but since these finishes are so close and you guys are also fast, it's probably safer to say one of the fastest. That sounds about right. So that's it. I'd like to thank Daryl Williamson and our students, Tom, Buddy, Stephanie, and Jillian, and the rest of the Horizon High School track team for helping us out today on ESPN Sports Figures, running on time. We hope you've enjoyed ESPN Sports Figures. Until next time, keep your brain in the game. I'm Brian Kenny. Thanks for watching. ESPN Sports Figures is presented commercial free for educators to tape and use in the classroom. For a free teacher's curriculum, to order the Sports Figures series, or lots of other fun stuff, visit our website at sportsfigures.espn.com. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in the sports. Sports, sports figures, figures. Put, put your, your brain, brain in the game. The preceding program is part of Cable in the Classroom, a free service of the cable telecommunications industry and your local cable company.